Thanks, Bill, um, for that welcome. And uh, a lot of us here at the Dole Institute, and I think a lot of you in the audience, have really been looking forward to this post-election conference. Not just because it's going to be a great conference, but because it means the election's actually over. <laughs> um, as with all of our programs at the Dole Institute, I would appreciate it if you would take a second to turn off your pagers and cell phones. Um, this is being taped, so if you do have to leave the room for any reason, uh, please kind of make yourself um, unobtrusive and sneak out the back there. Um, the format, basically, I'm going to give some very brief introductions. There are nice, detailed introductions of all of our esteemed panelists in the handouts that you received upon walking in. Please hold your applause until the end if you feel like clapping. Um, we're going to have five to seven minutes for each of the campaigns to trace out their path to the nomination in this case. Their, their, uh, their plan, as they saw it, if all things went well, uh, that was going to result in their candidate being the Republican nominee for president. Um, then uh, Joe Gaylord and I will be talking a little bit about, uh, we'll be using our own questions and questioning the panelists, both uh, the members of the media, the new media, and the campaign uh, alumni. Um, finally, we're going to open it up to Q&A from you for the last 15 or 20 minutes. I'll, I'll uh, decide when that time is. And there is a microphone right back here in the room. There should be plenty of uh, access to it. So if you have a question, make your way back there. One of our students will be at the microphone. Ask a question, please. Make it a question. Make it brief. No filibustering, as per usual. <laughs> um, then we're going to conclude this session with uh, time for a little bit of a break before we start our 4 o'clock session. Does that sound reasonable? OK, let me start with some brief introductions. My partner in crime here is Mr. Joe Gaylord. Joe has been a fabulous fellow here at the Dole Institute. Um, whenever you see Speaker Newt Gingrich, um, who after all is a PhD in African history um, and a quoter of Alvin Toffler, whenever it sounds like he knows what he's talking about politically, it's usually Joe <laughs> that's helping him out. He helped um, the Republicans take over Congress in 1994 um, and has really helped us here at the Dole Institute this past fall. Uh, to Joe's left, Beth Myers was campaign manager for Governor Mitt Romney and also served as the governor's chief of staff from 2003 to 2006. Ed Rollins managed President Reagan's re-election campaign in 1984. This year he served as national chairman and chief strategist for Mike Huckabee's presidential campaign. Bill Lacey, you all know, he's been director of the Dole Institute since 2004. He took a leave of absence to manage Fred Thompson's presidential campaign. To his left, Kelly O'Donnell is the Capitol Hill correspondent for NBC News. This election cycle, she covered the Republican presidential hopefuls. Jeff Earl, I'm sorry, Nate Silver is to her left, uh, managing partner of Baseball Prospectus, but he's really here because he's creator of the website 538.com. Political junkies in the room are very familiar with Nate's website. Um, Jeff Earl comes from a distinguished political family. <laughs> <laughs> More to the point, he has covered politics in Washington for the last decade and a half, most recently for the New York Post. Uh, Adam Nagorny has been the chief political correspondent for the New York Times since 2002. His first assignment for that paper was covering the presidential campaign of Senator Robert Dole. Um, Chris Hennick uh, was senior advisor to the Rudy Giuliani campaign and has held several important posts inside the Republican Party. Sarah Simmons was director, de I'm sorry, deputy director of strategy for John McCain's presidential campaign. To her left, Christian Ferry was the deputy campaign manager for McCain Palin 2008. And with that, I think I'd like to start with Ms. Myers talking a little bit about how uh, she and Governor Romney uh, planned to become the Republican nominee for president. Thank you very much, Jonathan and uh, Joe, for having us here today. Uh, we had a very e clear strategy. Uh, the only problem was that it didn't work entirely as we planned it. Our strategy was what we called the early state strategy. If, if you all recall, um, two years ago there was a lot of question on whether the Super Tuesday primaries would, would make the early states uh, as relevant as they had been in past elections, and we, we decided that we thought they were. So our uh, focus was on Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, Michigan, South Carolina, and Florida. And we wanted to win early and we wanted to win off often. We had sat down and looked at, our, uh, at, at what we considered our strengths and our weaknesses. And our strengths were that we had a smart, articulate candidate who was very telegenic and did very well on TV. He was willing to work incredibly hard. Um, we knew that he, would work, he could probably outwork anyone else in the field. Uh, he routinely worked 12, 14-hour days, and he had a family that was committed to going on the road, too. We had great fundraising networks. Um, 
we had relationships in both New Hampshire and Michigan that went very long and very deep. And Mitt had an ability to put in his own money. Therefore, we pushed, made a decision to push very hard to become a major player um, and, and be on the same, considered on the, main, the same footing as uh, the two sort of icons in the, in the race at that point, um, Mayor Giuliani and Senator McCain, who both had nearly 100% name recognition and were considered to be formidable uh, opponents and were you know, neck and neck for the lead in any national poll. Um, uh, we, we thought our major weakness is that, we, that Governor Romney was a, what we call a triple M, a Mormon millionaire from Massachusetts, which in a <laughs> Republican <laughs> primary um, really wasn't, none of those things were good. Um, and we were very concerned, even early on, that there was a, would be a potential strong candidate to the right. Um, so we pushed hard. We had some great early successes. Because Mitt was putting in his own money, we, we recognized the importance for us to have a very strong early fundraising uh, success. And because we, we didn't want to be looked at as a, as a guy who, who was just going to self-fund this thing. Particularly Mitt did not want to have that impression out there. Uh, so we had a, a fundraising goal. We started with a, our campaign. We, we launched it on January 2nd. And I think a you're, you're nodding. It was like January 5th. We had this thing in Massachusetts, which is a call day, where we raised six million dollars in one day, and we got four and a half million of that on credit cards, where we, we brought all sorts of people in from around the country to, to raise money in Boston, and so we jump started our campaign with four and a half million dollars in the bank the first week we went out there, which was incredibly helpful. Um, we went to the straw poll. Uh, we worked hard to win the Iowa straw poll. We thought that was important when it needed to have an early victory. Um, we also played hard in precinct caucuses in South Carolina and at minor skirmishes like CPAC and the, and the Family Values Summit. But we did have a, a big concern, and that was that uh, a candidate would emerge on the right, particularly in Iowa. And as it turned out, it, we didn't know exactly who that might be. Um, I always thought that Governor Huckabee was the strongest contender, but it could have been Senator Brownback or, or Thompson. Um, but we were aggressive with, with Huckabee because we, we knew he, he posed a, a, a very serious threat to our candidacy. Um, the plan was to win in Iowa. The backup was New Hampshire. Um, and Michigan, and we figured we needed to win one of those to stay viable uh, in going forward to through Nevada, South Carolina, which we really weren't playing that hard in, and on to Florida. Um, we, we won Michigan um, and uh, went down to Florida where um, we were uh, ultimately unsuccessful. And, and then we really, we, we stayed in it for one more week through Super Tuesday, but um, at that point, we, we looked at it and we did not have a long-term strategy for winning and, and graciously bowed out and uh, gave our support to um, Senator McCain, who we believed would be the nominee. Thank you. Thank you. It's a, it's a privilege to be here and especially to see my old friend Bill Lacey. Bill Lacey and I uh, worked together in the White House. Uh, he was one of my three principal deputies. The other two are governors of states. We couldn't find a state for him, uh, Haley Barber and Mitch Daniels. We couldn't find a state for Bill to get elected. Uh, he lived in Maryland. We knew we couldn't elect him there. So we happen. put him out here in Kansas. Not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, keep your day job. Then. Uh, I wasn't with uh, Mike Huckabee in the beginning. Uh, it began, as, as you described your campaign, we began with no money. Uh, no staff, no consultants, uh, and his family. Uh, he uh, basically, when he finished in January being governor, uh, he sat down with some of his key people uh, and he said, I'm thinking about this. Uh, did not have a penny, did not have a fundraising base beyond, uh, beyond Arkansas. Most of his major staff from uh, the governor's uh, staff uh, had gone out and gotten jobs and they weren't interested in going on a presidential campaign. So it really began with, uh, with his, his, his daughter, who was 25 years old, who was fabulous, who became the national political director. Chip Salzman, who's a great talent, uh, who had been uh, planning uh, Senator First presidential campaign. And I asked Huckabee one day, where'd you find Chip? He said, Chip had a plan and no candidate, and I had an <laughs> ambition and no campaign manager. So we came, we came together. Uh, the first time I, I joined in December, I sat down with Chip to go over the strategy. So I will tell you what his strategy was. Uh, 
a win in Iowa, uh, win in New Hampshire, uh, win in South Carolina, and then win Florida, uh, and then everybody else will quit. Uh, <laughs> at that point, we weren't going to Michigan. Uh, we were conceding that to Romney. And I said to him, well, what happens if that scenario doesn't come forth? He goes, I don't know. <laughs> That's our game plan. And we did very well on the first part of that, uh, uh, the Iowa, uh, which was really a grassroots, uh, and, and, I, and I think to a certain extent, uh, when you realize the amount of money that Huckabee had, uh, uh, I think he spent $600,000 totally in Iowa, uh, which is like a, a good congressional race. Uh, but Mike had a very extraordinary ability to communicate. Uh, and what we basically did without much television uh, is we put him on the free television. Uh, and between December 1st and January 15th, he did 350 interviews, uh, TV interviews, radio interviews. He did it 24 hours a day. And I think to a certain extent, he had a very clear message. He was very articulate. Uh, uh, obviously, Iowa was a grassroots effort. Uh, there, were, there were lots of natural constituencies there, uh, you know, going from six, eight, ten people to, to big crowds in, in the end. And I think to a certain extent, uh, uh, you know, it was one of these that happens historically where a campaign catches momentum. And when the momentum catches up to its lack of organization, it gets done in. Uh, when I got on there, I basically, uh, tried to put the pieces in place to get beyond Iowa. Uh, and once again, we didn't have a fundraising base. We did most of our fundraising on, on uh, the internet. It started coming in, obviously, as we won Iowa and what have you. But it was just, it, we could never get ahead of it. We obviously didn't have the, the, the staff to do policy papers and what have you, but the great ability of Mike Huckabee to, to get on his computer every morning and sort of do his own thing, uh, and his great ability to, to speak words that came off as great speeches that were actually from the top of his head. He was as talented a candidate as I've ever seen and as lovely a person as I've ever seen. But there were fun, fun days. It was sort of like I get a call from our two advanced guys who'd driven from Iowa to Texas, uh, and they'd been arrested on the border. Uh, they arrived about uh, 1 o'clock, and they called me, and I said, well, what's going on? And, uh, and they said, well, we're out here with a flashlight looking for a, for, for a site tomorrow. And I said, well, did you call ahead? I mean, who arrested you? Well, the immigration. I said, they probably think you're sneaking into the country. You know, it just did sort of like, uh, it, was, it, was, it was, for me, it was a great campaign because it was, uh, it was first of all, a great candidate and a lot of great young people. Uh, which is what our party needs to be again. And I think to a certain extent, uh, part of, of Mike Huckabee's great appeal is that uh, he understood the Internet. Uh, he himself is very, very oriented that way. We had a lot of bloggers. One of my, one of my favorite stories of the campaign, and, and you were there, was we had a bloggers uh, uh, press conference. So we had about 50 bloggers in the room. would only take, uh, and all around the back of the room were all the national press. This was getting close to, to Iowa Day. And we're taking no questions from them. We're taking only from the bloggers. 50 bloggers in the room and 500 bloggers on the phone. And I sat there and I watched that and I said, you know, this is the future. Uh, this is clearly the future. Uh, and I think to a certain extent, uh, uh, you know, we couldn't, uh, we were able to put a little block on you. Uh, I think if you would have won Iowa, you'd have been much more, more formidable in, in, uh, in New Hampshire and it might have changed the, changed the whole dynamics. Our race was kind of like a NASCAR race. You know, we sort of bumped into each other along the way, and, and, and cars went by the wayside. Uh, uh, Fred Thompson obviously did us in, and South Carolina took enough of the boat away from us that we couldn't get that state. I think the tactical mistake we made is we shouldn't have gone to Michigan. We had to go to New Hampshire because, obviously, that was after we won Iowa. Uh, I think if we had another week or two like we used to in the old days, uh, we, were, we were gaining fast on, on momentum. Uh, and I'm not saying we would have won, but we certainly would have been uh, more credible there. Uh, but we were so compressed in this whole drill that it was, it was hard to, even if you had big resources, and combine that with the winner take all in so many of these states that, uh, that uh, you know, we might have had a better process for all of us if it would have gone on longer. And, and I think to a certain extent one of the great advantages that, uh, that Barack Obama had at the end of the day is that they had run a long campaign. Their team was was uh, continually getting better as it went along. They were organizing everywhere, and I think to a certain extent it worked, worked to a great advantage. Our campaign obviously was over, I think we quit at the same time. Uh, Texas, uh, we didn't win Texas. We won some southern states on Super Tuesday, but we weren't going to, we knew we couldn't go beyond where we were. We had no money for television anywhere, no money in Florida. Uh, and I think to a certain extent when, when uh, we knew that he was McCain was going to get the significant votes uh, to be the, be the nominee. Uh, we we pulled out. Uh, there was a there was a moment or two Huckabee wanted to go on and take the take the take the convention. He got caught up as many candidates in and sort of the crusade side of it. Uh, 
one of the real disadvantages that we had is that the Christian coalition, which was sort of our natural base, didn't believe in us initially. Uh, and they were, some with you, some with uh, other candidates, uh, they just didn't think Huckabee could win. And I think he made converts out of a lot of that. And what I, what I found uh, in the course of it uh, is that uh, these gigantic mega churches that are out there today, there's a lot, of, a lot of this organization that goes on that's beyond the national spokespeople that we're all so, so used to. Uh, there are pastors and there are thousands of people in the pews every Sunday that have their own independent, uh, they're very much a part of our party. Uh, we have to basically uh, cultivate them, but we can't cultivate them just simply by, by going to the old national leaders and saying, you know, come with us and this is the best candidate. Uh, uh, I think that the other advantage that Mike had was he was, uh, by young people particularly, he was viewed as cool. He could play his guitar, he could uh, be Chuck Norris, which is this extraordinary phenomenon that I knew nothing about. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, when I heard Chuck Norris was coming, I said, gee, that's great. You know, I remember Chuck Norris from his movies uh, back when I was in the White House. But all of a sudden, there's this great <laughs> kid cult out there. And it's just, it's amazing. The University of South Carolina, about 20 football players come running up. And they said, there he is, there he is. And I thought they were running to Huckabee. And I was trying to think, oh, why are they going to Huckabee? And it's Chuck Norris. And uh, I wanted to pitch with Chuck Norris. Uh, but I think what, what, what it was about is, it is about that internet. It is about those methods of communications. And I've done this for 40 years, and, and, and my first political mentor was a Democrat, uh, Jess Unruh, legendary figure in California, the speaker. And he told me the business is about this. When you run a campaign, it's about finding your voter, communicating with your voter, getting them to the polls. Uh, there's a lot of ways to do that today. Uh, still the same three principles. Uh, I think the Democrats proved that they understood all the new game, uh, and they did it very, very well. And I don't think we're quite there yet, although I think we had bits and pieces of it in each of these campaigns. And I think to a certain extent, uh, uh, it was an extraordinary, extraordinary phenomenon to go through. It was a campaign that was great fun. I love being around the young people who would say to me, Mr. Rollins, what was it like in the old days? And I said, what do you mean by, <laughs> what do you mean by the old days? I mean, like before Blackberries. They said, before Blackberries. I said, I was even there before cell phones. Uh, and then they said, well, no cell phones? How did you do this? I said, you'd get off the plane, you'd go get some quarters, you'd find a pay phone, you'd call back. And it was sort of like, wow, how could you do that? <laughs> so. When dinosaurs roam the earth. So. Um, I'm sure we'll come back to a lot of those issues, but let's get to Senator Thompson's campaign. Yeah, thank you for the setup, Ed. Um, and I'd like to take this opportunity today to announce my candidacy for governor of the state of Kansas. Uh, in all seriousness, uh, when I went to the Thompson campaign, it was five months before the Iowa caucuses began. There were essentially two pathways to victory. There was a pathway when I got there, and there was a pathway that we came up with uh, after I realized the first one wasn't going to even come close to working. The original pathway idea was that you cut a few videos, you have Fred author a few uh, uh, op-ed pieces in key newspapers, you have him campaign a little bit around the country, give a few key speeches, and he gets elected president. Well, everybody sitting around this table knows that that's not how it works. <laughs> There's something called slogging through the trenches in Iowa and New Hampshire, and every candidate who's ever been elected, at least in the contemporary period, has had to do that. So we basically had to do a complete rebuild of the campaign from scratch. Essentially, when I got there, uh, there were some good personnel in place in key areas. Uh, the political operation under Randy Enright was excellent. The policy operation was first rate. The uh, finance operation was very strong and very good, uh, but uh, the communication shop, everyone in the communication shop had never set foot in a political campaign. I don't mean a presidential campaign, I mean a political campaign. Um, there was no campaign plan, there was no polling, there was no strategy in place. Uh, the finance chairman who had been recruited eventually resigned in the fall. The head of the major donors group that we had, uh, who had been recruited uh, early, early in the process, uh, was found out to be a cocaine dealer from the early 1980s. <laughs> That's no joke, by the way. Um, and so in essence, what I was doing from day one was triage. I was trying to figure out, I was trying to figure out what are the two or three things that we have to do today to keep this thing going and to keep, keep it moving. Now, we did have a strategy that we thought would work based upon our polling and based upon our knowledge of the, the Republican Party. Uh, basically, it was number one to make the case that Fred Thompson was a genu genuine conservative in the race. 
I think most people thought that Senator McCain, that Mayor Giuliani, had conservative tendencies but weren't conservatives. I think a lot of people thought that very clearly Mike Huckabee was a conservative but that he was going to have a natural ceiling that he could never pass. And then I think with Governor Romney, our feeling was that even though he was running as a conservative, he had to do some tough things as governor of Massachusetts, which basically created flaws in his conservative credentials. And so that was part of it. The second part of it would be that, based upon my experience with Fred in 94 and 96 in his Senate races, was he's an outstanding communicator. We thought that that would work dramatically in our favor. And then the final thing going for us was that Fred seemed to poll well in the, in the research that we very quickly did after I assumed control of the campaign in August. He polled very well among Southern voters, Mountain State voters, and non-industrial Midwest voters. And it was our goal to make a strong enough showing in Iowa. We knew we could never win Iowa because of the level of retail campaigning uh, that it takes to do that and, and frankly the lack of time we had to do that. But make a strong enough showing in Iowa to give us a legitimate reason to continue on into South Carolina and the South and ultimately win in South Carolina and use that as a springboard to success. Obviously the campaign failed. I think it failed for two principal reasons. Number, number one, uh, we simply did not have enough time to build the infrastructure and to put together a strong strategy. And number two, there's another factor there that we had not faced in the 94 and 96 races and that was the Arthur Branch factor. And by that I mean in 1994, Fred had run for office, uh, or had never run for office. He had been and done bit parts on TV and in movies, but he wasn't identified as a character. He had no persona. So the person that we put out on the stump did not conflict with a persona already established in people's minds. And I believe the fact that the persona that uh, we put out there was different from the persona that he appeared as on Law and Order actually cut against us and worked against us. Uh, it was a great opportunity for me. It's great to be back here at the Dole Institute to be able to organize events like this. But it was really, like Ed said, it really, and, and I hate to say this, Ed, but you know, I'm an old guy too now, and it was amazing. You know, people used to say faxes. What the kids would say? What did you use faxes for, for on the campaign? <laughs> and uh, used to, you know, I'd have a BlackBerry that Susie can tell everybody would just sit there all night long and just buzz at you, just hiss almost at you, and you just wanted to throw it away. So it was a great experience, but it's great to be back here, and uh, it was a tough six months, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Glad you're back. Chris, you're next up. Well, I can state from the outset that, that uh, being the GOP national front runner was not illusionary. Uh, I think what really proved that was when Charlie Cook of the Cook Political Report wrote in probably late April that he was seriously reconsidering his earlier statement that he would win the Tour de France before Rudy Giuliani would win the Republican nomination. <laughs> now, now, one of the things that I guess we, we lost by not winning, winning the nomination, I would have loved to have seen Charlie Cook at the Minneapolis convention <laughs> wearing that yellow spandex shirt. <laughs> anyway, I, think, I think I got more kick out of that, but, uh, but uh, from what we, uh, the, the front runner ship was fascinating to know because both John McCain and Mitt Romney had planned on running for president long before uh, Rudy Giuliani uh, thought about it, I'm certain, uh, and the organization that you had with PACs and where you'd gone to help candidates was, I mean, uh, those two were the candidates. And we found ourselves right after the 06 election with uh, roughly 53% uh, roughly of, of all Republicans in Washington Post surveys. Uh, what was more impressive, we were leading among likely Republican can uh, of, of, of constituents and voters, but we also were leading among first and second choice likely Republicans. But even more interesting, we were leading first and second choice combined self-identified conservatives. So let, it was more or less a sense of, of geography. If there's a lot of history in this campaign, but what's been most fascinating is that undisciplined primary calendar that all of us faced. I don't think I've ever been in a campaign where we didn't even know what the election day was right. in many states. So I believe that our campaign, our, our, our path to victory first, we knew there were 107 delegates in the first three states of, of uh, Iowa in the caucus in the two primary states of South Carolina and New Hampshire before that. 
But uh, what was more fascinating was the message, what, what, uh, what Bill talked about, their challenge was, was to define and where the themes were. And if you looked at those observations, we, we clearly were, had to manage the expectations of the front runner, not only for us, but we also had the advantage of Hillary Clinton at the time being the Democratic front runner. So that juxtaposition actually helped us. When we finally had to become the front runner, we had no choice because the polling allowed it. But we also had to fill in the, the gap of, of, of likability, being the physical conservative. The mayor had cut taxes 23 times as mayor, uh, worked for Ronald Reagan in the Justice Department, so he could clearly claim the Ronald Reagan mantle, non-Washington, uh, and a leader. So if we look back at the, the attributes of what we needed to get accomplished, and this is where uh, I was talking to Christian early. This is where uh, I think Rick Davis uh, he, he misunderstood because our primary campaign, when we stated we're going to run an attribute campaign, not necessarily diminish issues. Rick, Rick was on that track too because John McCain had high leadership quality characteristics too that would have been an attribute strength. But when, uh, when we look back at the 2000 exit polls and we saw John McCain defeating George W. Bush in New Hampshire, McCain beat Bush on attributes, not on issues. When Bush beat McCain in South Carolina in 2000, he beat McCain on attributes, not issues. So all of these qualities were very, uh, very, very critical for the Giuliani candidacy. The, the electability, though, was, was the most fascinating one because, as, as, as Bill knows too, with working with Senator Dole, since we're at Dole Institute of Politics, back in 1988, he was the electable candidate. I'm more electable. Lamar Alexander, 1996, ABC, anybody but Clinton, I'm more electable. But I think that even, interestingly, John Kerry, 04, electability nominated him. And Republicans were looking for an electable candidate, one who really wanted to communicate. I think a lot of Republicans, uh, what they've seen with the, the eight years of, 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 of President Bush's White House, which they really want to nominate to communicate. So that was one strength that was electable. And, uh, and, and so that was, that, that was a strength that we, that we had and couldn't deny. But another point was that we had to earn this nomination. It was not going to be given to anybody, certainly in Rudy Giuliani, from the perception of, 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 of social issues and the challenges that we faced. So we were less about geography and more about, uh, and more about where we needed to go on that. And I think that was our key challenge, was that we weren't out to change the social orthodoxy of the Republican Party. And not only were we, were we not, I think we, we proved throughout the campaign that we were exceeding on that front as well, too, uh, in a lot of instances. Uh, there, there were quite a bit of, just if you look back just historically, we, uh, you know, we had Fort Dix kind of confirm the, of the terrorist incident in, in March. That kind of fit our whole focus of where we were going with, with the, at, the, the attributes of of where the issues were, certainly on, uh, on terrorism, security, leadership, with the economy uh, as, as fourth at that time, if you could believe it. Uh, and then going into the May debates, the second, July second quarter, first quarter fundraising, and then going into really where we were going in the summer. Uh, and we had these 12 commitments that you may have read about. A lot of people, I think, talked talk they were the 12, the 10, uh, the 12 commandments as opposed to the 10 commandments. <coughs> I won't pull them out here for you, but uh, but that really helped get us into a future tense for Rudy's candidacy. You heard a lot about his mayoral ship and what he did as mayor. The one good thing that those, those commitments did, they gave us a future tense, but also they filled in the gap throughout the summer on issues. So uh, that really led us to the, to, the, to the month of August, which was very, very critical in, uh, in making decisions and where all the campaigns were, particularly among where the primary campaigns in the, in the states to decide upon where to spend money. At that point, Romney and, uh, and, uh, and, and Senator McCain had proven that they were leading both in, in, uh, in Iowa and certainly in New Hampshire. And you had New Hampshire where you had John McCain had won it in 2000. Mitt Romney had summer home next door. Uh, so the expectations were right where we wanted both in New Hampshire as well as in Iowa being a caucus, not a primary and the amount of time that uh, Mitt Romney had spent out in Iowa. So we had expectations going right into our, uh, our, uh, our geographic side. So I will, uh, I'll save the, uh, fortunately I'll save the, the months that leave on August uh, after this rap, uh, rap sheet that I'm seeing. Okay. There's, there's plenty of time. The McCain campaign, 
Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, uh, Joe, for hosting this panel. It's particularly nice to be here at the Dole Institute. My, my first job in politics was as a press intern in the 1995 Bob Dole for President primary campaign. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's kind of a nice honor for me to be here at the Dole Institute after uh, having been a part of his campaign uh, at the lowest of low levels uh, in those days. Um, you know, we could spend probably two or three panels talking about the strategy of the McCain campaign because we had so many of them. Um, <laughs> our, our campaign was, was a roller coaster ride, if there ever was a roller coaster ride. But I think that, you know, you really have to break the McCain campaign down into two different, the primary campaign, into two different phases. Uh, the first phase was uh, uh, really started in November of 2006. And the strategy was to build a large national campaign uh, that was going to focus on the early primary states, but build out a national uh, organization and a national infrastructure. Uh, we were going to try to become the, the new mantle for the Republican Party uh, and make ourselves into the next guy in line. Uh, there's this saying that Republicans always not money at the next guy in line. Uh, John McCain had run for president in 2000 as an insurgent. Uh, we had lost. Uh, and so we were looking to become that next guy in line and, and to really become the national front runner. Uh, after the 2006 elections, there was sort of this vacuum in the, in the Republican Party, uh, and we decided that was an opportunity to really step out uh, probably a little bit sooner than we had anticipated and define what that is going to be for the Republican Party going forward and, and try to become uh, the messenger for that. And uh, Chris, you know, building off of what you said on, on issue-based versus attribute-based, if you go back and look at the speech John McCain gave in, in November 16th, uh, 2006, uh, which was really our first campaign speech at, at the GOPAC conference, mm -hmm. it was a very issue-based speech. Talked about, you know, the American people were still center-right. Um, um, that 2006 hadn't been a defeat of Republican principles. It had been a defeat because we had lost our way on corruption, on spending. Uh, there was a big policy proposal on, you know, making America competitive in the world and fighting wasteful spending and getting back to fiscal conservatism. And interestingly, if you read that speech, there's only one paragraph about Iraq. Um, and it was a, a brief little mention, but it was a distinguisher uh, not only between John McCain and, and the other Republican candidates or who became the Republican candidates, but also between John McCain and the President Bush at the time. And, and I want to read the paragraph because it's just brief. But he said, Americans are tired in our, of Iraq because they're not convinced we can still win there without an intolerable loss of additional lives and resources. I understand that. But in no other time were we more morally obliged to speak the truth to our country as we, as we see it than in a time of war. So let me say this. Without additional combat forces, we will not win this war. Um, and that was the only mention he made in that speech about Iraq. And, and again, it was very issue-based pro-surge, pro-putting more troops in the field, uh, but it really wasn't about kind of McCain's character. Uh, John, you started off the panel by saying you wanted to hear the plan if all things went well. Um, well, nothing went well for our campaign at that point, and that plan didn't work. We were not able to become the national front runner. Uh, Rudy Giuliani took that position. Uh, we were not able to raise enough money to, to maintain this national infrastructure. And, uh, it was pretty clear after the first quarter of 2007 that we weren't going to have the resources to build that, uh, build that national campaign, yet we continued to do it. Uh, and then by the end of the second quarter of 2007, uh, the campaign fell apart. Well-documented personnel changes happened. Um, two distinguished fellows, Sarah Simmons and Christian Ferry, were fired from the campaign. Um, it was a sad day for America. <laughs> <laughs> uh, along with, with hundreds of other staffers, um, and, and the campaign was millions of dollars in debt. Uh, a couple weeks later, or, or 10 days later, uh, there was a leadership change in the campaign. I got this you know, great offer uh, from Rick Davis. I was sitting at the beach, and he called me. and said, like, wouldn't you like to come back and work on this McCain campaign you know, that everyone says is over and done? And by the way, we can't pay you for a couple months. It was a great deal. Uh, I, I rushed back to DC to jump at the opportunity to, to be a part of the McCain campaign. And, and Sarah was wiser. I called her and tried to get her to come to, and she's like, not quite ready for it yet. I took, um, I took a little sabbatical, but came back eventually. But that, that period of July really was a new start from the McCain campaign. We, we had nothing to lose. 
Uh, we were down and out. We were millions of dollars in debt. We could not run the national campaign. We really started to focus on the early primary states of Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina. Uh, we, we continued to look at Michigan as an option. Uh, we, we didn't really consider Nevada as a state that we could compete in. Uh, it was all about Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina for us. Uh, the other thing we did, we couldn't afford any polling at this time, so we went back to some polling data that had been done in May of 2007, and we found this chart. Uh, and it's an interesting chart if you look at it. Basically, 38% of the electorate was split between John McCain and Rudy Giuliani. And there was a big chunk, 17%, that were between the two of us could go either way. So we had an 11% core, Giuliani had a 10% core, and there was another 17% of the vote floating between us that, that was eligible, uh, accessible to us. Mitt Romney was out to the, to the right of us, 25% uh, of the vote, and then there was this group, 23%, that was probably further to the right of Mitt Romney. Mm -hmm. At the time, uh, this was kind of Newt Gingrich voters, uh, Mike Huckabee voters, Fred Thompson wasn't yet in the race. So what we realized is, in order for us to succeed, we needed Rudy, Rudy Giuliani to come down. Uh, we needed to pick up some votes from Mitt Romney on the right. Uh, but we didn't have to worry about Mitt Romney voters kind of hopping over us to vote for Giuliani and Giuliani voters hopping over us to vote for Romney if we could stay viable. And that was really the key for our campaign in that period was to stay viable. We uh, stole a line from Merle Haggard. Uh, our, our campaign theme became, if we could make it through December. <laughs> and if we could make it through December, stay a viable campaign, kind of hope for Mitt Romney and Rudy Giuliani to, to fight each other and pick up what fell off from the two of them, uh, we would stand a chance to win those early primary states. What quickly became clear was Mike Huckabee surged in Iowa, and that became less of a focus for us. And we staked our campaign on winning the New Hampshire primary, using that momentum to South Carolina, to Florida, to Super Tuesday, and ultimately to the nomination. Fantastic. Thank you for, for those. Um, just before we, we get to the uh, more direct questions, I'd like to open things up to the rest of the panel and, and ask how you all, from your reporting, from your research, saw the state of the campaign once the votes were about to be cast in the beginning that, of 2008. Without taking anything away, without taking anything away from, with, from the McCain people who I did, and, or McCain, who I think did do a lot of sort of gutsy things. I mean, they did pull the campaign out from nowhere. This the campaign was very much a last man standing next to to me. And again, I mean that to respect to all of you. I can go through every single one of the major candidates here and say why um, I don't think you ever probably would have going to get the nomination. I, w I would never put on spandex, but I was sort of like, uh, and I'm from New York. I've known Giuliani for a long time, and I always thought for a whole lot of reasons, none of them disparaging. Well, maybe a little bit, but that he would ever get the Republican nomination. Um, the Triple M thing. I think Huckabee was to maybe with more time and more money. So I, I, to me, like the story of the Republican race was last person standing. And again, I say that without taking anything away from the fact that you guys ran a very, very spirited, gutsy campaign in New Hampshire. After that, we can talk. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think I actually think you're totally right about that. And that was one of the reasons, you know, it's it, it, Christian has a long history with the McCain with the McCain organization with the family. But you know, it, it, at the end of 2006, I was coming off the Schwarzenegger campaign, you know, and I, I got a call from Beth, I got a call from Terry Nelson. I was sort of, you know, and I didn't get into too many discussions with you. But as I was thinking through it, I thought, okay, you've got a triple M. You know, at that point, Giuliani was the next biggest campaign, and you're sort of going through it, and you're like, okay, fundamentally, there are things that are, are undeniably true about politics. And John McCain was the candidate to me who had the best chance of getting through that primary process. Well, I enjoyed the memories of uh, hearing some of these events <laughs> and uh, remembering in real time the sunniest expectations of each of the stories that you've told. And it's interesting now, especially with the campaigns that didn't succeed, to understand how things unraveled. I was particularly <coughs> struck, um, spending time with Bill, about the, the note and Huck, the Huckabee campaign. The idea of uh, the importance of retail politics, the importance of being perceived as tireless, and how significant that was early on. Huckabee's success, I think, in many ways, was force of personality, coupled with um, a political resume, a, a point of view resume that gelled with many people. But his personal charisma, especially if you're covering it for television, was very important. Uh, Senator Thompson had a terrific resume, but very quickly was perceived to not have a fire in the belly. That was one of the persistent questions. And I remember the first time Fred Thompson went to Iowa, the state fair, that is a candidate's rite of passage, it was an aerobic journey through that uh, fairground because he moved so quickly. I'd never seen a candidate not linger, not shake more hands. 
he did not appear to have a comfort factor with that necessary part of retail politics politics while they had this early conception of using new media and speaking directly to voters bypassing traditional media that sounded so good but in the reality of what people want in getting another candidate especially in iowa new hampshire where they are professional voters they needed that i was also struck by how with my cockabee his cool factor as you describe it was so unexpected because playing the the base i went to many of his events and they were filled with young people filled with people who just wanted to see what he was about and he was a very entertaining candidate when you would attend a mccain event his charisma is a whole different kind of thing and the town hall format where he would take anything that was coming at him had a different sort of interest level for people who wanted to attend but if you knew that my cockabee was going to play the base at the end you you had a lot of attendance and a lot of interest and it was fun for those people who were covering it and again for television that kind of stage craft was invaluable and uh, when you talked about the blogger call i remember being in the corner trying to convince you that i too was a blogger because my work also appeared on msnbc.com <laughs> and um, <laughs> that was unsuccessful yeah, but the three I didn't know what a real blogger was <laughs> i couldn't tell you what you could exactly. be <laughs> but uh, when you talk about 350 interviews much to mike huckabee's credit he uh, spoke to me on camera many many times he was very accessible and it would be things like jump in the van with him with the cameraman in the passenger seat up front and talk the entire way to the next event which is a lot to expect of a candidate who has to do a lot of other things between events returning phone calls planning getting themselves collected and so he was very accessible and again that was hugely helpful to us in telling the story helpful to the candidate who had less money and uh, it was always amazing to us that i was getting phone calls from the giuliani campaign urging me to go to florida can you come and interview the, the mayor and we were really compelled especially in television to be in iowa and new hampshire those early states because from our sort of mandate we had to follow that calendar and uh, so all of those attempts to spend more time with the mayor uh, just simply logistically were impossible so uh, those days were incredibly fun um i also should say that while there's a lot of tension and there's there's an adversarial relationship i have the greatest respect for political professionals i appreciate the difficulty of what you do the uh, the good spirit in which you do it the patience you have for us we can be colossally annoying and um <laughs> it's great fun so it's it was a wonderful uh, ride and uh, i appreciate what you've done and and uh, we certainly wish all of you well and we look forward to doing it again the next time If I could jump in on uh, on Christian's chart for a second, um, you know you had these two giant uh, giants among the group, right? Of, of Giuliani and of McCain, and you had a, the largest chunk of voters were there um, for the getting between them. And w- one of the things I'd like to talk about is is why was and and you mentioned this period of time where McCain was stalling, he was hemorrhaging money, he had built too large of a campaign structure, looking too far ahead. and so he was listing and that this is uh, congruent with Giuliani has you know very high name recognition um uh he's got a you know a reputation as a hero of 911 this is his opportunity to to try to punch McCain and and make something happen and for for whatever reason he Giuliani maybe because of his his um not having uh not being in sync ideologically with the party or maybe because of just some bad luck of the events that came up during the campaign about his children and his family and what not and uh, divorces and his mistress and this kind of stuff he he had he had some tough he had some tough breaks but but in your purse but but Giuliani wasn't able to to capitalize on, on I'm doing his dirty work for. So Giuliani couldn't do that and and so this is what allows, you know, a candidate like Mike Huckabee who had, you know, was running on um, you know, charisma and intuition and and some smart decisions but not a huge campaign budget. That that's what allowed him to to make some things happen in Iowa. So it's it's just it's interesting you you guys were fighting over that 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 finite but large group of voters and and the front runner couldn't couldn't make that happen. Well, it it is uh I think I believe it was Rich Lowry wrote a, a, a simple kind of thing that, that Giuliani and McCain were 
moderates and national security voters in Romney and Huckabee were conservatives and evangelicals. I don't think it was that simple at all. In fact, uh, in fact, it was all, all, all for the timing uh, and all. I know we were, I know we were going after every, every, every all, all four of them. Uh, but I think that you're talking about the not being able to go after McCain when he had a chance. What was working for Rudy was was, and that's why it was working so long, was he was attacking Hillary at the time of the front runner in all the debates. He wasn't attacking any other Republican, and it was working. The, what the question remains, though, that was, that was through August and, and September, where it really would have made a difference, would have been going into, uh, going into the fall months of, of October and November and December. And I think that was the reluctance of the mayor to, uh, to, uh, to go after Senator McCain when there was a possible chance. What was working for us, too, was a multi-candidate race was helping us as opposed to trying to limit it to a two-person race or a two-candidate race. Uh, he certainly respected John McCain. Senator McCain knew him personally and, uh, it, uh, and for, will forever remain very, 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 very close. And I think that was a strategic sense that, uh, that he made, but clearly there was an opening there. And I believe I'm still confronted by the Romney people thinking that they confront me saying, you didn't do your job well enough. <laughs> and I hear the same thing from the McCain people, that you didn't do your job well enough going after Romney. When you should. But, but I, think, I think Romney was, uh, Governor Romney was, once again, the mayor really respected him and knew him as well, too. But there was a chance, uh, I think even greater than McCain, with a contrast drawn uh, against uh, Governor Romney on fiscal issues, as well as independence in New Hampshire, because where where that was that was the biggest challenge. Where we were both fighting over independence, but independents were coming the mayor's way based on his health care proposals, uh, compared to where we could have had a chance to contrast what Governor Romney did in Massachusetts with health care. So we had a we, we we definitely had all kinds of angles uh, to make a contrast, but. Uh, well, I think I'd, I'd like to kind of jump in on that too. I think that there's a few things to consider too during the the, the year-long primary process that we were all a part of at, at various stages. I mean, I think you start off at that early part and really leading on national polls. You know, we always had in the McCain campaign and said, well, that's meaningless because you have to win these early contests. That's because it, we weren't winning them. Truly, true, but true, but the huge part of it. We didn't have any polls. <laughs> but part of what is, I mean, but the clear part of what is important on leading on those national polls is what that does from a fundraising angle. I mean, it makes you a front runner. It makes people have to pay attention to you. And, you know, frankly, the call day that you guys did in January, it, it, it scared us. I mean, we saw that and we thought, okay, well, now we aren't the front runners in terms of national <laughs> polls or in the money race. I mean, that was an early indication. Exactly. I mean, that was a strategic decision, too. It was, was smart. That, that we had, how do we make ourselves into a front runner? We can't do it on name ID overnight. The way we could do it was to do this big splash mm -hmm. fundraiser. So, we, you know, we looked at, you know, I said to Spencer's Wick, this is not a tactical thing just to raise money. It's a strategic yep. and very, very purposeful event. Right, and that's why I think the national polls matter. But, you know, then you do have that underlying reality of the way you win the nominations is, is through this, this path through these early state and winning those delegates. And we also know, you know, if you look historically at either the Democrat or the Republican primary side, really the polling positions change dramatically based on who wins those races. I mean, you know, Howard Dean was crazy ahead, then he lost, and he was, you know, and he never never rebounded from that. And I think you, you, you can go through, we had actually charts and charts and charts of things that we gave as fundraising presentations for here's why it doesn't matter that we're, you're not winning on the Washington Post survey, but it matters that, you know, ARG shows us up six in New Hampshire or whatever, you know, which on some sense was our strategic response to, to make sure that people didn't think we were out of the race. Um, but it is, you know, one of the things that you have to battle against. So, so why didn't they, you know, why didn't Giuliani attack us when we were, when we were stumbling or why didn't we attack them? It's, I think that it's very easy to second guess, but when you look across the, the reality of what you have to do for a year, I don't think any of the campaigns were anxious to go in on full attack against each other because you knew it was going to start in January and it was going to be really challenging to maintain that. When do you, you know, I remember those early discussions, you were in a lot of those meetings where we were having those discussions about when, you know, when is the appropriate time to sort of bring up, you know, this piece of oppo or that piece of oppo because you knew that that was going to begin, you know, it was going to be the beginning of the end, sort of. So I think that that, you know, it's, it's very easy to think for, sit from the outside and say, why didn't you do that? But it's, it is these multifaceted, you know, decisions that you have to make. One other thing that was a factor this time is the paid media did not work like it had historically. Uh, you spent more money on paid media, so you know it better than anybody, uh, because there were so many other sidebar things that were going on. 
Iowa and New Hampshire really are the retail politics. The one thing that got us in this race, which is a decision we almost didn't make, which was the straw poll. Uh, obviously, you had the resources. You, our second place in the straw poll meant when he walked out of that room with no expectations, all of a sudden he was a media darling. Uh, he had all, you know, you, you had some of it, but we had, we had all the rest of it. If we hadn't have done that straw poll, he would never have been a factor. Uh, and, and you think of all the money that was spent on television by, by all of you, uh, you know, our little floating cross uh, Christmas card, uh, uh, <laughs> which was not a cross, <laughs> you know, got played over and over and over again. And I think to a certain extent, the role of cable television now and the ability to drive your message with that, which is, you know, 12, 14 hours a day, is totally different than I've ever seen before. And, I, and you may be able to argue with me because, I, once again, I didn't have polls and I didn't have paid television. I just, as an observer of the process, I don't think the television worked like I used to, the paid television, to where you really ran a commercial, saw numbers really moved dramatically one, one way or the other. We but saw... Aim, was, it, was, it actually, was Ames, in retrospect, a mistake for you guys? In other words, you gave him an opportunity to do the sort of come from behind victory. I remember the whole weirdness of that night. When, I mean, Romney won, but how could we got the headlines, right? Right. I mean, we were very pleased, obviously, to, to win because we didn't have a natural constituency in Iowa. Right, right. But we're and the election's so, over. So, so that, you know, it was, it, was a, it was a challenge for us, um, and we were very pleased to have won it. We walked out of there, though. One of the things that Ames did was there was this sort of jumble of candidates mm. over on the right. After Ames, it was very clear to us if it hadn't been before, that the, that the jumble on the right was going to very quickly turn into a Huckabee candidacy. And so Ames, Ames absolutely, we were, we were celebrating, and, and there was a contingency there that, that was really happy that he had beaten Brownback, and I was like, no, no, time out. That was not a good thing. Um, Brownback, if Brownback had the expectation that he was going right. to win. So Huckabee winning was very, very bad. Because Huckabee would not have won Iowa had he had not won the straw poll. No, he would not have been yeah. a player. Right? No player yeah, I mean, that was very significant. <coughs> and as I said earlier, I, I'm convinced if we had not won Iowa, you would have won Iowa. Right. You'd have had all the momentum going to New Hampshire. And it yep. very tough for McCain uh, to beat Agree. Yeah, it's just, uh, you know, where we got distracted, I mean, the idiotic thing for us was to go to Michigan. We should have gone to South Carolina. And I was surprised you went to New Hampshire. I thought you were going to go from Iowa. We, we, to we just to we had to take advantage of the media, uh, and, yeah. and it was you know we it was we, there. It was yeah. there, so we had yeah. to go there. And then the other thing that happened to us in South Carolina, since your candidate had to do the mea culpa on the Confederate flag uh, from 2000, we were mm -hmm. bound to determine we had we had Beasley as our national uh, as our state chairman, had been the governor who got entangled in the Confederate flag. That we had went in there saying we are not going to touch this flag, we are not going to touch this flag. And I said we're not going to touch this flag with a ten-foot pole. And then when he basically said I wouldn't touch this flag with a ten-foot pole, the flag was all of a sudden wrapped around us. Uh, and, and of course, she did a very effective job of making sure it was wrapped around us. Even. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do, I do think Thompson staying in the race in South Carolina was significant. He, he finished this. Thompson, Thompson, I'm yeah. the real conservative. I, I can give you the quote. Uh, I should let Christian talk about that because I was. And I also, I also, I also had a candidate who didn't want to go negative, and I think to a certain extent. Uh, was that for real? I'm I, sorry, I mean to interrupt. Was, I admit, was that whole thing for real? The whole the announcement. Here's, that, here's the story yeah. of that. Uh, we were we were getting killed by them. I mean, they were pound. I mean, we we did not know it in the sense we we didn't do polling, but everybody was telling us that you've got to fight back. You've got to fight back. I was arguing that certain states where negative commercials do not work. Oregon's one. I was one. Um, Minnesota historically has been. When you do them, it backfires on you. We had reached the conclusion that uh, that we needed to fire back just to rally our troops. We only had two days before the thing, so we went. We cut a spot, and it was it was a fair spot. My real drill was what I wanted to do was to drop the opposition research, which I had a package about this big, as I gave all the press, the media, and hope for the last two days that they would lay out all the things that they had done or hadn't done uh, and let the media do, do the job. So that was, that was the, the, the initial drill. What happened is I got up that morning and I watched television from 5 to 7, and there wasn't one single speck of space anywhere. And I thought, one commercial is not going to work. Uh, and I, and I called Mike, and I said, Mike, you are very unhappy about this. Your family is all torn up about this. Uh, let's, not, let's not go with the, uh, with the thing. And he said, well, I, I've got these things in the morning. We won't be able to talk about this till about 1130, which is why everything was sort of in play for the press conference, which was a real mess. But the idea of the press conference was not the spot. We were going to show the spot. We are going to give everybody a copy of the spot. But we were going to put a package out there 
of everything he'd done as governor, not done, and what have you. So the, whole, the whole opposition research, and then expect you for the last two days. Then equally as important, what we wanted to do was no one in Iowa knew we weren't going negative. Uh, and so we wanted to make sure that people in Iowa knew we weren't going <coughs> negative, which is really what I'm talking about. Let me make a point, Joe and Jonathan, on, on back to Ames and the challenge we had with Iowa as, as a national strategy, a national candidate, a delegate candidate, not a caucus primary candidate. Uh, we saw Ames as a straw poll, not a delegate <coughs> poll. It had no delegates, and we were hoarding and saving our money strategically. I believe we're the first campaign in the Republican Party ever to decouple Ames' straw poll and still think that we're going to participate in the real caucus where there were delegates. So it's going to be fascinating to see in future our Iowa strategy will they, will they follow that and, and, and not participate in Ames but still have an intention perhaps to hold off and then still participate because we were, despite the outcome of Ames, Rudy Giuliani was second place in Iowa up to October. So there was this tension, are we really going to play in Iowa or not play in Iowa? That, uh, and there was two distinct wings in the camp that, uh, that did not want to play. So. Chris, can I, can I just ask, ask a question? Well, when did you decide to play, period? I mean, <laughs> but, but I think the question is when, 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 when do we decide well, not to play? Well, no, it's not, it's both. It's you weren't going to play, play in Iowa, Iowa, and then you didn't play in New it's Hampshire, and then you weren't going to play in South Carolina, and then you were going to play in Florida. And New Hampshire. It's like New Hampshire, too. Or, and, well, Kelly's like, and it, it just, Florida, it, Kelly. just for, as an observer, the, the, the question is why did you put that off so long? Uh, you're looking at it from that perspective, yeah. but it's backwards. But if you look at it where we were, that there was no strategy to go 0 and 6. You put that much more harshly than I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you, you, the good question this panel is asked is how, how can a, how can a, a, a delegate strategy candidate end up with no delegates? But, uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> what occurred, and I think what, what Jeff, J Jeff alluded to, we, there was chronologically, if you look back at where we were going, we had, from September, I mean, we, we had the Petraeus testimony. When moveon.org attacked Petraeus, will they betray us? So we hopped right on that, and that was a key win. Also gave us a chance to, to go after Hillary Clinton on the willing suspension of belief. We never thought we'd have both the NRA with guns in the, in September 21st and the values opportunity speech on October 20th to draw common ground. So we both had opportunities to talk about uh, uh, and, and, and face that challenge of what the orthodoxy was presented. So we were really moving through September, and then certainly October was critical. But if you look at that month of November with Pat Robertson's endorsement on November the 7th, followed by Bernie Carrick's indictment on federal tax evasions on November the 8th, the very next day, yeah. followed by, uh, followed by uh, the cars. 18th of November when there was a sus uh, expected endorsement uh, in Florida, that would have meant uh, a lot of momentum for a non-momentum delegate strategy. And then the November 28th YouTube debate where we were in debate prep and 4 o'clock in the afternoon the Politico.com story broke on what Jeff was talking about of, uh, of the mayor expenses trying to hide in uh, obscure agencies with, which thanks to the New York Times uh, <laughs> it wasn't on the front page of Adam, but at least the New York Times at least had, had the correction where it, 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 it wasn't all factually accurate. But we're running an attribute campaign, and when you mm -hmm. run on character and leadership, the yeah. bottom fell out in New mm -hmm. Hampshire. Got it. On November, uh, uh, up to December 1. Mm -hmm. New Hampshire voters know one thing. They study elections, and they, they, they see daily movement. And when the bottom fell out of New Hampshire, despite running ads prior to that on tested and having the opportunity to maybe contrast with with Mitt Romney, we had no choice but to go to Florida. Mm -hmm. We were bummed out when you pulled out of New Hampshire. Because we were looking at the same numbers that Christian was looking right. at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the same, the same exact diagram. I, I think there was also something else happening late in the year, or really from September going forward, and that is Iraq. 
uh, Iraq changed significantly. Uh, John McCain had been this early advocate of the surge. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, it was really about the issue of Iraq. It was, you know, are we going to change our policy? Are we going to put more troops in? Uh, the president made the decision to do that uh, in the first half of or the first quarter of uh, uh, 2007. And by September, we were actually seeing real progress in Iraq. The situation was improving. General Petraeus was coming back to give a, a right. status report um, of good news. We hadn't had any good news in Iraq. And, and Iraq, I think, then became an attribute issue for John McCain because he had had the foresight, the knowledge, you know, the warrior leadership. background, the leadership, the, the war hero, all that came together in, I was saw this, you know, three, four years ago, called for a change of strategy, and I was right. And that allowed him to come back on an issue that had been a real liability. Um, you know, the Iraq war was not popular in New Hampshire, where we had to win. Um, by making it an issue about leadership, an issue about judgment, an issue about character, uh, we were able to talk to New Hampshire voters uh, on that issue in a way that we hadn't been prior to that point. And I think that that was uh, something that, that Rudy Giuliani was trying to take up as well, but when you had uh, you know, Mayor Giuliani talking about the, the war in Iraq and, and the war on terror and, and John McCain, who actually got proved to be right on the issue of the surge, it was, it was much more difficult for the mayor than it had been for us. And I think two other things on, on the No Surrender Tour and, and that sort of the surge, the impact of the surge and what that, what that did for John McCain. It allowed him to talk about Iraq. And, you know, he had spent the first half of the year talking about it in very somber tones, which I think is appropriate. I mean, it's a war where many of our young people are dying and there's, you know, all this very serious, um, frankly, negative energy around the way he, he was talking about it. He suddenly can change the page, talk about it in a much more positive light, a much more successful light, and it was an ability for him to really draw a distinction um, between, you know, that he had asked the president for this change, that there was a distinction between his policy on Iraq and on George Bush's policy on Iraq. And I think that was, frankly, very important um, for us to survive that, that period of time because it, it did give him a different, a different tone, a different color than, you know, who we eventually had to run, you know, the party we had to run with yeah. into the fall with, you know, very low job approval for the president and all that. I want to change this up just a little bit because now uh, hearing that Beth and Governor Romney had almost the same chart that you guys did, um, was there a Republican campaign in this cycle that was attempting to enlarge the electorate? In other words, you guys During the primary? Yeah, in other words, you guys are fighting over these voters while it seems to me that Senator Obama is collecting cell phone numbers and, and new registrations. Well, I think, though, the, one of the reasons that he was able to do that is, as a party, our approval ratings were low. Yeah. The president, who was a member of our party, had all-time low <laughs> approval ratings. The right track, wrong track in the country was not in the right direction. I mean, it was a very hard place to be as a Republican candidate, and, and we learned it in the general election just how hard it was to be <laughs> the Republican nominee. But in order to grow the party at a time when your party's not popular, uh, you know, Obama had a great advantage there, and the Democrats had a great yeah, advantage. Yeah, the Democrats, the, the, the media climate. environment, too, for them. I mean, like, you look at the, the period of time between when we were, you know, really the nominee in March, when, when Huckabee, and, you know, dropped out in Ohio, that, that, that night of the primary, we got 1,189 delegates, and June 3rd, when Barack Obama be really became the nominee. Right. It was a fascinating race. I always said, you know, if I hadn't been doing the job I was doing, the other thing I'd want to be was like a PhD candidate who's getting primary access to all of that data because it was fascinating. First, you know, African American candidate, you know, Hillary Clinton, a really dynamic woman. Um, the media attention surrounding it allowed them to go pick up voters. I mean, they went and organized in states where Democrats had never had a competitive primary, and they did draw in new voters because, frankly, it was a sexy, exciting race to be a part of. But the know? other thing is, you couldn't you couldn't run away from Bush. Eighty, you know, Bush may have got down to twenty nine percent approval rating, but eighty percent of those were. Were Republicans. Right. The moment yeah. anybody anybody even took one step away from Bush, you, you paid a price for it. I mean, we were stuck. I want to let Nate have a chance because he actually knows the numbers. I'm oh, trying to draw like diagrams and stuff like <laughs> yeah. that. But <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I'm a little surprised. I mean, you know, surprised about it is we're talking today about electability, but you didn't really hear very much of that uh, during the campaign. And I wonder if any of the uh, staff here thought about well, let's go ahead and say. We're, we are not going to be a traditional conservative. We're going to run for the center. That's how we can win this race, you know. Maybe criticize Bush and try and get independent voters mm -hmm. in open primaries like Michigan and New Hampshire. Say, screw the base. I mean, not quite that explicitly, <laughs> right? But That's not how you win primaries, though. I think everybody, everybody up here who's been involved in Republican Party primary, or, you know, primaries, that's not how you win a primary election. And our job was to win a primary election, because that's the first step in winning a general election. Yeah, that would have been the kiss of death, yeah. for a Republican candidate in the Republican nomination fight. 
And if you were an independent voter who was unhappy with George Bush and you were looking at on election day, am I going to play in the Democratic primary or the yeah. Republican Party primary? You know, you're going to play in the Democratic primary. So uh, I don't think that there was much opportunity to really go after those voters, particularly in the states where the Republican Democratic primaries and it was open or on the same day. If anything, you were trying to out Republican each other to be yes. perceived as more conservative, more traditional, and not as independent. And I think for Giuliani and McCain, their independence, their their social views that were a little bit farther to the left were liabilities. Right. Well, but you know, if we're talking about expanding the electorate. I mean, there are a lot of people who identify now as independent who were Republicans you know, two or four years ago. The, the moderate Republicans didn't totally disappear. They're calling themselves independents now. If you can really reach out, maybe not expand the electorate to new voters, but people who recently left your party say, hey, this is a bigger tent. There's more here to do than just the kind of, you know, conservative right, you know. I don't know. I think right, but I, I don't think those people left because of social issues. Those people left because of the revolution that Joe Gaylord was a part of in the early 90s because of many of those, you know, members of Congress who had been, you know, in Washington all of a sudden were taking money from Jack Abramoff and were going to jail. And you had a president who was involved in an unpopular ward. I mean, no, it's not, it's not your fault. I mean, that's the reason I became a Republican, you know? No, I'm saying, like, that was, like, that was a revolutionary. I, I don't mean to, I'm not being critical of you, I promise. I promise, because that's when, that's when I became a Republican. I mean, now, that's let me when take I was out of the McCain college. campaign. No, but, you, you know, you look at those people and you say, like, those guys were reformers. They came to Washington and they fought, you know, they fought against Dan Rostenkowski. He used to open his drawer and hand out money. And all of a sudden, now they're the criminals. They're the bad guys. That's why those people left the Republican Party because the Republican Party spent us into debt. Because they're, I mean, those, that's why those moderates left. It wasn't because, you know, I don't think it, I think going after them by saying, I, I, you know, I just think what you're presenting is a much more challenging picture, and it's not how you traditionally not how you win Republican primaries. Well, it's also you know it's it's a line that McCain used throughout the entire campaign was you know Republicans went to Washington to change Washington and Washington changed us. Yes. Um, and I think that's a big reason why a lot of those independent voters had moved away is because they had been attracted to this this contract with America and, and the '94 Revolution and making government work. Government didn't work when Republicans were in charge towards the end, and, and that was a big problem. For them. I've never understood, and I've been doing presidential campaigns for a long time, why we go to Iowa, why we go to Iowa and New Hampshire, we go to New Hampshire in January. Four electoral votes. Hawaii has four electoral votes. We went to Hawaii, had a primary in, <laughs> in January. We could change the whole dynamics of the party. We could reach out to independent voters. Yeah, I mean, but you have a nice Iowa, time. We'd, right? all be, we'd all be fighting to go there. We're going to nominate you the next Republican National I mean, it, it's, it's true, but you look, you look at those states and you say, like, okay, how do I win in Iowa and South Carolina, two, you know, relatively traditional states? I mean, Iowa is, like, the oldest state, you know, even throughout the course of the general election, the voters that were considered swing voters or undecided voters up until the last day were women, white women that were over the age of 60. You know, I mean, so I think you you look at that, and it's like a pretty conservative issue set that you're going to talk about. We're well, I'm saying you're not going to win. We're definitely not going to get rid of Iowa now. I mean, Iowa's now here forever. You have to win Iowa or New Hampshire, you know. Right, to stay in the mix. So it's a New Hampshire strategy, I suppose. <laughs> Right, but in New Hampshire, I mean, I think you looked at that and you looked at the 2000 results when John McCain won there and you saw a bunch of independents who went in and pulled Republican ballots. Mm -hmm. And looking at this election and the dynamics of it, I don't think anyone on our campaign, and I wasn't there during the final decision, you know, the final decisions going into New Hampshire, but I don't believe anybody on the McCain campaign thought that lots of independents were going to go in and pull Republican ballots. Well, and I wonder whether, particularly for you, for you two, um, would have any criticisms of the current process for, for this reason. Um, John McCain had such a um, well-honed brand over decades, right, of being an independent a maverick who would take on the president and do what he thought was right. And he had a very unpopular president. And I understand that McCain's own views are that he was very much a father of the surge and is, was on board with the Iraq strategy. But he didn't have, it doesn't seem to me, really any room in the Republican primary process to be that candidate, if you wanted to be that candidate, was there no class uh, path to victory as sort of the John McCain of 2000? I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure it's necessarily being the John McCain of 2000. I mean, George Bush wasn't president in 2000 when we were, you know, running for, for president. It was it was a very different different world in 2000. And in 2008, he was the incumbent president. He still was incredibly popular with the people who actually were going to turn out and vote in the Republican Party. Um, and and you know, the issue set. I think the main issue being the, the war in Iraq, uh, John McCain and George Bush agreed uh, at that point that a surge of troops in Iraq was necessary. Uh, he had supported the president in the decision to go to war in Iraq. And so, it, you know, trying to say that he should have, uh, you know, created a, a, 
distance himself from Bush on the defining issue, I think, of the day, or one of the most important defining issues, they actually agreed. Uh, so, you know, he wasn't going to try to be something that he wasn't for the sake of separating himself from George Bush. And actually, you know, I think one of the things that, that changed early on in the process was his initial position on Iraq, being that we needed additional combat troops in November of 2006, and uh, going back to 2004, he'd been saying, that was a, a dis distinguishing point with Bush. Um, after the president initiated the surge, it was no longer a differentiator. John McCain is once again, you know, aligned with George Bush. And I think come, you know, the general election, uh, we could no longer stand up and say, well, you know, we, we, we opposed the president and we fought for this new strategy uh, because at that point it was all muddled up and it was Correct. a Bush strategy. You know, no, no one was willing to say, oh, yeah, I remember John McCain, you know, four years ago standing up for this. So. Didn't you guys, the Giuliani people, the McCain people, per your question, hey, didn't you guys toy with trying to do the electability argument? I, I, I would hear sort of aspects of it at times. You know, the Giuliani, oh. you know, I can win, I, I can win all these Democratic or independent oh, that, that, deal that, with you yeah. guys. Yeah, that was my earlier point. I was trying to make it, you know, it didn't work in 88, 96. Right. It yeah. clearly worked in 04 for the Democrat, but we were faced with it, so why not, it, why not take it? It right. was there for the asking. So we did run with it. The, the point, though, is when you start losing electability is when you fail to contrast your, your, the, 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 your activist party uh, yep. voters, <laughs> they wonder, are you really the strongest in the fall? Right. Are you right. gonna, are, if, if, if you're not willing to fight in a primary, can you fight in a general? So you, so, so. Is that uh, true for Democrats and Republicans? Uh, it's definitely true of Democratic voters. Uh, it's, it's clearly. I, I subscribe to it on this party, but I, but I do think it's, it, it is pretty much a fool's goal too. Right. It'll, 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 it'll disappear on you. Very Giuliani and McCain, there was suspect mm -hmm. about yeah. real conservatives. Right. That's what I was going to say. And, and you had, I mean, you clearly had were suspect, yeah. and and the Maverick tag was. It wasn't just George Bush. I mean, John McCain, who's a man I have great admiration for, has pissed off a lot of Republicans. And the fine gold and the immigration issue, yes, which, immigration. Was, mm -hmm. which was yeah. really the issue that basically he had, he had to duck and move away from in the course of the primaries. But you know, he wasn't about to debate his position on, on immigration. And if he would have, I don't think he would have been on But it came up all the time at town hall meetings. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. the reaction in the room was often hostile. People just were very upset about it, and he would sometimes ex yes, explain and explain and explain and explain right. to try to uh, put that aside. And climate change would come up again. Early states where there mm -hmm. was town halls and very active voters, and so the, the independent ideas that you're talking about weren't always things that would get into stories that I would do in two minutes at 6:30 at night. But if you lived through the events day after day, you could sense that those were tough issues and fair tax for Mike Huckabee. There were strong advocates for it and people who were just railing against it and, and were very suspicious of his, um, his spending in uh, Arkansas. And so you had all of those internal dynamics of voters within the Republican Party who identified themselves in different bands of what it means to be a Republican, and they were definitely uh, you know, clashing in those early going. And it was tough to be any of these candidates at that time. Right, and I think the electability question too, like why wouldn't we have brought that up? I do think that with the activist group of people that you deal with during a primary, and right. I think this is probably true on the Democratic side as well, when you say electability, what they hear is soft on the issues I care yeah. about. I mean, on the right, on the right, I think electability means your medium on, you know, on the life issue, your medium on spending, you know, maybe you'll raise taxes. But then you know, you get you're, these, yeah. you're mushy. But you get these in Congress moments uh, in that situation, like um, Governor Romney saying, I'll double Guantanamo. People on my side are, were, were just, what is, what is he trying to do? Um, someone who's got a reputation as a, as a competent governor, he saved the Olympics, and here he's talking about, you know, so, something like this. I just don't, electability is something that, um, it sounds like it's a I think that worked better with Democratic voters and Republican voters because you guys have been in the White House for eight years and yeah. Democrats okay. are really, really hungry. Did right. Romney go into that debate meaning to say that double the size of... Well, I, mean, I remember I was at the typewriter. I, like I don't think... It, it wasn't a line that we had... We had <laughs> reversed. <laughs> but... <laughs> 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 but 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 I you know I, I think he is it's a new story. The yeah. line he didn't rehearse. <laughs> yeah. We all know that everyone has yeah, we've lines had that, that they that they the ones put out for. there. On, but um, no, I think I think the point he was trying to make is Guantanamo is a very complicated uh, situation, and I think that's going to be discussed. You know, right. as we try to untangle Guantanamo, I think Absolutely. the point he was making is is we, we we need to you know this is not the time to to let this loose. We need to double down on how tough we are in terror, and it didn't come out quite 
perhaps um, like that, but he wouldn't step away from that. I think you're right. That I think there's a contrast with a big contrast with Democrats. Electability is not was not a dirty word with Democrats this cycle. I, people were hemming and hawing about they just they wanted a winner. Sarah, but, Sarah nailed it. What what electability means in a primary race is squishy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean it's like he doesn't really you know yeah. maybe maybe he'll switch so, his position if that makes him more electable on yeah, the stuff Chris, that I care about. Yeah, I think, Chris mentioned that Dole was the electability candidate in '98. That was our theme, but that was our theme, guys, because George Bush was the vice president for a guy named Ronald Reagan, who was a very popular conservative, and we couldn't go to his right, uh, and philosophically yeah. Dole wasn't to his right, so we argued that, and we lost. And in, in 2000, uh, John McCain tried to make a big case on electability, on being the only Republican who could beat Al Gore. Um, in fact, we actually ran an ad, and then the graphic in the corner was a USA Today poll that showed McCain beating Al Gore. and. Uh, uh, we know how successful that effort was for John McCain, <laughs> and ultimately he wasn't the only. Well, kind of the only debatable. Republican. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me let me phrase it a bit differently. Do people think it's a problem for the GOP that the uh, the primary base is so conservative that you can't have different kind of coalitions like you might have within the Democratic Party in the primaries? I think we do have different coalitions. But they're different parties. Yeah. Yeah, I think we. Yeah, I think. I think. Well, I think two things. I think the bigger problem that the Republican Party faces. You know, Ed talked earlier about you know tax, some tactical issues like blogging and how we communicate with voters and all that stuff. The bigger problem we had this election cycle was message related. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we we had a smaller. You know, we when we went through all of our micro targeting stuff and you know you're making all these budgets based on how many voters you need to contact that are your base that are people you know are going to vote for you. The numbers were astoundingly small, mm -hmm. in some states. That's the bigger problem, is that people, for whatever reason right now, are not identifying with our party on a message level. So do, do we need more bloggers to communicate with them? Yes. So first, you know, but first. But first, what are we going to say to them as a party that is a cohesive message that people can get? This is what part of what I'm saying. If everyone's always running to the base, the base, the base, the base is about, you know, I think 22% of America identifies themselves as both conservative and Republican right now. You know, it's not all that big. And if you keep doing that, then it kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, I suppose. That's the only votes you'll get. Well, I think we need to expand our base by what we talk about, not by necessarily, you know, by figuring out how we talk about the issues that define our party. Which are still, I mean, the, the, Which, the country still is a center-right country. Yes. I, I don't think that, I think fundamentally... Well, I, I don't know what that means. I mean, uh, Pew did a survey where they asked voters, are you conservative, liberal, or, or moderate, right? All people that said they were conservative, a plurality want some form of national health insurance. Mm -hmm. You know, a majority want the Bush tax cuts repealed in some form. You know, I think I think saying that well, it's a center right country because people. I mean, conservative is a stronger brand name than uh, than liberal, right? But beyond that, I'm not sure what it means. I mean, it's like saying, well, I'm a Ford customer. I, I just don't like any the of their cars. Here, that's exactly what the problem is. Like, what does conservative mean? And I think it can mean a variety of things. And it may mean some help with health care. It may, but does but does it mean a national health care system that taxpayers pay for from bottom to top, or does it mean helping you know small businesses that are you know a, a small corporation? Does it mean you know figuring out a way for them to access you know health insurance plans that are affordable? I mean, I think that those are two. What you're talking about is two very different things, and what our party needs to do is figure out how we talk about those issues from a conservative standpoint in a far more, frankly, a, frank, a marketable way. Yeah. You know, when when Arnold Schwarzenegger talks about climate control, or when he talks about you know greenhouse gases, he doesn't talk about well, you know, we're all going to have to eat hemp and you know and, and drive cars that don't accelerate. What he talks about is we're going to build a hydrogen highway so you can still you know live the life that you like. Because he knows that that's a much more marketable idea than, you know, you know, everybody having to wear a hemp sweatshirt and clogs. <laughs> I mean, that's why, he, that's why he's a Republican who wins, who wins in a state. That, and I, I know that sounds sarcastic, and I don't mean for it to you, because I think that's a huge part of what, what our problem is as a party right now. And then, you know what? And then you're right. We need to figure out how we do MySpace better and Facebook and blogs no, 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 and all I'm this. Not, I'm not saying that's the secret. Well, I, I right, think no, no, no. I know what you're saying. I get, I get what you're saying. Our, our, dilemma, our dilemma is we start in Iowa and New Hampshire. And, I mean... We, and, and no matter what else we are, and no offense to, to Joe, who's an Iowan, who, who ra first raised the flag of, of Iowa. Iowa is a, is, a, is, is a real retail state. It's now, it's not going to go away. It's more significant than ever. I mean, Huckabee came out of there, gives it hope to any other candidate. Obama came out of there, gives, so it's now right there up there with New Hampshire. 
The problem is the primary process was so contracted this time. It was crazy. And it was crazy. It was just, it was, you know, going back to the last man standing. I mean, even last man standing, which you guys were, you were broke. I yeah. mean, it was just. No, well, actually, and, we were $3 million right, in debt. Yeah. And yeah. how, and how, <laughs> this, how this idiocy, came, I got asked by the New York Times, how much would it cost to compete in all these states? I said, there's a old strategy of probably hundred million dollars. Yes. And you ran it. That became that became the the point. If you're really going to compete in those states, we didn't compete in those states because we couldn't afford to compete in those states. But I think isn't there a benefit to that too? I mean, if if we really believe that part of our part of the strength of our country is based on voter participation, then isn't there a value in going to these smaller states where actually a candidate like Mike Huckabee doesn't have any money not, or John McCain doesn't I'm have not, any I'm money? I'm not arguing money. against. No. I'm just what I'm arguing though that they become the way we were also contracted this time. There was no recovery time. Yeah, I think the problem true. isn't necessary that we start in Iowa and New Hampshire. It's that we have front-loaded the process yeah. and contracted And the winner-take-all. Winner and, and I think it's starting in Iowa and New Hampshire is, is, is actually a very beneficial and important thing. Because and it's going to happen. Money is not the right. determinant factor in those yeah. two states. Yeah. It, mm -hmm. is it, they are two retail policy states. <laughs> they are two states where the citizens and the voters take their responsibility very, very seriously. You know? They, 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 they talk about it in bars, you know, mm -hmm. are you going to vote in the primary and are you going to vote? To, the people are wonderful. And I yeah. think anyone, and all of us no, who've gone through just... this, this process and have gone to New Hampshire and Iowa come away with an incredible respect for the voters there. You'd love my Hawaiian primary, though. <laughs> I, I, I agree. <laughs> a lot nicer there in January, I think. Just a, a question so from early on. Were any of you or any of your campaigns involved in moving the primary calendar no. around? Just totally hands off that operation? Joe, I tell you what, that's a good question. What we saw was the Democrats were moving the primaries, yeah. particularly in New York, Illinois, places where it was going to benefit Senator Clinton. Mm -hmm. And we of the Giuliani campaign were all for that because it looked exactly moving up to FIB 5, where the big states, the national mm -hmm. strategy was. So we, we didn't uh, mm -hmm. get involved because we didn't really have to. They, they were doing the work that for, for us was strategic, we thought. The, the other thing in, in the kind of last man standing strategy but uh, uh, from Nagurney, was there any kind of conversation between campaigns about what was going on in Iowa and who could help who and who could help who in New Hampshire or South Carolina yeah, did or anything like that? Fred stay in as long to help John McCain? No. No, I mean, uh, we, did any of that happen at all? No, we stayed in the race because we honestly believed that we had to achieve a win in South Carolina to have any chance to win the nomination. We also felt that if you look at a, if you look at the Rasmussen daily tracking poll at the end uh, at mid September after we announced Fred was number one nationally, there was a steady slide after that, just steady, consistent <gasps> erosion after that. By around December 12th, which was the date of the uh, Des Moines Register poll, we believe that Fred was the best candidate in the race. That's where he took on the moderator in that in that uh, in that debate. And uh, all your guys started to raise their hands to answer the question. He says, "I'm not into hand raising today," and all their hands went down. At that point. Uh, and uh, uh, and we thought he was the best candidate from that point forward. But the bottom line is, from the announcement. To that point in December, it was a steady downward fall, a steady erosion. So we were out of it by that time. We thought we didn't think we were, but we but we were. In I want to leave some time for a question. So if you do have a question, the mic is over here, and, and Chelsea and Clarissa can help help out with that. But is there any is there any plan afoot to decompress the primary calendar for next well, time around? I think there's sort of genies out of the box. I mean, it's very difficult. Right. Yeah, but they're, you know, in the they, hundred yes, million. Yes, there, there is that. The they didn't RNC, pass that thing at the RNC. Well, they yeah, did. The it's convention. alive still. Okay. It is alive. The Ohio, Ohio and Wyoming Ohio and Wisconsin. And the hard part is that anybody who wants to be relevant now knows that they need to be at the beginning of the process. Right. So, I mean, it's not, it's, it's like, it's not, you know, what state's going to say, well, you know, we'll move ours back a little bit because, you know, that's, that's where you get into the challenge, I think, of how you negotiate. Did you, you might see some that start, that starting really, like really early just ate up higher. resources, yeah. time, and energy, yes. or didn't make any difference? I certainly ate up resources. But, but it, uh, to me, it was, it was going to be, you know, I, I didn't, it, it just was the game, the lay of the land, and we just played. Yeah. And Beth, do you want to go proportional like the Democrats? Because that didn't work out so well for them in May and June. Um, well, I, I think the I think the the Democrats got an advantage over the Republicans by stretching out their their 
um, primary. I mean, I was at a, an event at the Kennedy School with a Barack Obama representative who said, you know, it was around the time of the Kentucky primary, and she said, we are just ecstatic about this huh. because we are now spending, uh, we are building our general election organization. Yeah. We're going to have an organization in, in Kentucky with 10,000 volunteers, and it's we just need to flick the switch on in, in, in the fall. And when she said that to me, I, th I, I was thinking of you guys and, and how, how much, you know, <laughs> You weren't going to have any of that opportunity. Uh, Indiana is the perfect example. Yeah, yeah. Indiana is yeah. a great really example. North Carolina, yeah. mm -hmm. and right. and so I think we, as a party that we need to we need to make sure that we don't we don't cede that territory to the, the Democrats and um, a way to to make the process go longer is proportional. But I I, I haven't really thought about it. Whether I, I think it's a good it. or bad. The, or other, the other problem with like ours the way ours extended out. I mean, with Huckabee stayed in until March, you know. That was like every Wednesday morning we woke up and thought, how much more do we have to spend? You know, how much, what's the minimum amount we have to spend? Could've because we didn't have cheap. anything. Huh? Yeah, could have bought us real cheap. <laughs> no, and like, you know, I hear it. A validation. <laughs> but that, but that, that was a real frustration on our end because, you know, we didn't have any time to recoup. We, we didn't have a ton of time to recoup. And then the story from the media was, well, you know, is, is McCain going to lose Virginia to Huckabee? Is he going to lose? And, and the fact of the matter is we didn't, you know, we didn't lose. So it, you know, we, what, we lost the Kansas. You had the worst of both George. Worlds. There were some down yeah. the last night. That, right. yeah. But you that were, was sort of you weren't, fun. You weren't yeah. building an organization, but you weren't. Right, because our race was not anywhere near right. sexy and exciting. That's exactly but it was right. this sort of like the negative drumbeat from the media and yeah. us trying to figure out like, okay, well, we can I, spend 60 cents and we'll do that. Too, we didn't have the money to be building an organization. We, right. we, we had been a, a three-state campaign. And after, uh, you know, our people from Iowa went to Florida and the people from New Hampshire, they became our... our uh, our February 5th, you know, headquarters up there, and we were just hopscotching staff all over the country because we had we didn't have the resources to build that out ahead of time. So, you know, when it got to the point of, of after Super Tuesday, then having to run campaigns in Virginia and, and Ohio and Texas, it's like, okay, well, well, who's free? And it was two guys who had left Iowa, you know, six weeks ago, and were still in Florida, and they'd already been in Missouri twice, and well, sent them to Texas. Uh, and let's try to right. put something together real quick. Right. And uh, th that was that was a very difficult period. We didn't have the staff. We didn't have the resource. We didn't. We were, we were broke. Mm -hmm. um, and no matter what we did, if we win, uh, the media would report, well, they didn't win by enough, or my Cockabee won, um, you know, conservatives, and that shows a real problem mm -hmm. for McCain going forward. Or, you know, so it was really a difficult situation. It would have been us. a great birthday present for me on March 19th if you offered us the vice presidency and we would have quit right then. If I <laughs> you. Now they hear it. <laughs> <laughs> let's all, we are on a tight schedule, so let, let's, let's hear from, uh, from you in the audience, and we already have someone. Hi, I'm Bill Lunds. Uh, I'm with a group called America for Prosperity, mm -hmm. and uh, we uh, appreciate you coming to a Blue County in a red state, and uh, we appreciate you being here. And, uh, one of the things that To be honest with you, I think you're totally right, that we have to get back to the tenants that are, are widely held, you know, and that people believe. And I think who the leaders are going to be is, is an open question. You know, I mean, I think we, we, don't, we don't know who that is today, you know, and we don't know who's going to, you know, and who the RNC chairman is, I think, is maybe secondary in terms of who actually takes the mantle and decides to be a leader on issues and on how we communicate those issues. I just think it's an open question. But I think for, the first, for the first, I'm sorry. Uh, one of the things we need to do as a party, though, and, and I love Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan's what inspired me to get into politics. He is my political hero, everything else. But we need to take those principles of Ronald Reagan's and make them relevant to young voters yes. today. Yeah. Voters who are 18 years old were not born, uh, Ronald Reagan was not, you know, around uh, for them. They, during their formative years of, 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 you know, high school and, and college, you know, 
Bill Clinton and George Bush were president of the United States. And when you start talking about Ronald Reagan to, to younger voters, their eyes kind of glaze over and they don't get it. And we don't make those principles relevant. And I think that's a big challenge. Something our party needs to do going forward is, what is it about the Reagan principles, <coughs> the conservative principles that matter today? Well, for the first time, we're a true opposition part. Yep. We have no part of the governing process. And I think it's a perfect time for us to articulate what it is that we are. Mm -hmm. And it may be just being against a lot of things. And even if we're against them, we have to articulate why we're against them. We are now on a socialist track. Uh, and the word socialist may, may be more clearly defined in, uh, in six months or a year or what have you. And we're going to spend more money than we ever have before. Uh, we're going to see the benefits or not the benefits. And I think to a certain extent, for us as a party, we have to somehow coalesce uh, call us around certain ideas, whether it's being fiscal conservative, whether it's strong national defense, whether it's rebuilding our military, whether it's taking care of our troops when they come back. What are our priorities? Because I think the reality is that uh, until we're clear about that and can articulate that, I used to always have great discussions with, with Newt Gingrich about the importance of the message versus the messenger. I'm a great believer that the messenger is a key. Totally. Ronald, Ronald Reagan became president because he wasn't Jimmy Carter in 1980. But the fact that he had a very core message and belief and an agenda, people all of a sudden started listening to it and they could understand it. Newt Gingrich, as a messenger, had a very clear-cut core message, uh, which Joe helped uh, go from 25 ideas to... to, 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 to uh, but that's instrumental in rebuilding our base, too, because right now we're a party of old, fat, white guys in Washington. And I'm, that's me. And I'm, I'm in New York. <laughs> but no, I mean, you look, I remember in 2006, I was in California, and I was working for Schwarzenegger, who doesn't look like a typical Republican, no. right? He doesn't sound like a typical Republican. He's got a tan, and, you know, he speaks with a, with a really thick accent. But, you know, we're watching that, and I remember, you know, Denny Hastert doing a press conference after the Mark Foley debacle. And I looked at him and I thought, oh, that's not me. Right. That's not the people. That's not the people I'm working with in this huge, diverse state that are Republicans. They they look different than that. They're young people. They're women. They're Hispanic small business owners. They're you know. And I think that expanding um, you know who we're talking to is what you're talking about in terms of how do we expand our base. But I think that is an ideas and a messenger based thing much more so than you know in the primary. How do you tactically sort of do that? I think it's a much it's a bigger. Umbrella, the umbrella has to sort of be built before we can, you know, stick in all the individual prongs of how we tactically go about doing that. I think, I think we all need to keep in mind, too, that in 1980, in the 70s, in the early 80s, the Republican Party was a party of new ideas. We were the party that were applying conservative principles to the problems that we faced at that point in history. Uh, we've lost that over the years. In, in the year 2008, the Republican Party was the party of George Bush. George Bush arguably did not govern as a conservative, not according to Reagan's principles. I think that came back and bit us. And so, Christian, I think you're absolutely right. We've got to apply the principles to today's problems. Let's get to one more question, because we really do have to uh, end this session and, and, and uh, take a break and get ready for the next one. But let's listen to the question, and then if, if we can return to the, the, the second part of the first gentleman's question, who are, the, who are the emerging leaders in the party? I think that would be a great place to, to conclude. Sir. Thank you. My name is John Sedek. My question is this. You seem to have grand strategies for each of your campaigns, but it seems that so many of your campaigns had to fight against opportunistic uh, uh, events that came over you, or vulnerabilities, or uh, news reports about expense vouchers, or phones ringing at the NRA convention. I mean, there were all these things <laughs> that happened to you while you were going someplace else. Did the strategy really matter? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm someone who believes in two things about this business. First and foremost, your candidate matters. And second, your campaign matters. Uh, you, you sometimes can win with a great candidate and not such a good campaign. You can't win a, a presidential election unless you have both. And you can't win a presidential election unless you have a strategy. You can't do it tactically, day by day. You've got to basically, this is how I define my candidacy, here's how I define my opposition. That's a strategy. And I think to a certain extent, we've gotten away from being good strategists, and we've become very much good tacticians. I think that's right. Well, I think the 24-hour mm -hmm. news cycle plays a big yeah. role in that. Yeah. It's, it has changed the way we strategize. It's changed the way we, you know, it's about winning every day. Right. And if you think about trying to win every day, then you're going to change right. your tactics right. to try to win every day. And, and that makes it very hard sometimes to stick to a strategy. But I think the things that you talked about, you know, they get thrown at you. They might, they're, they're many times expected. Um, but you just don't know when they're coming, and that's part of the fun of this business. I think it's why we all do it, is, is you never know what the next day is going to bring in a campaign, and the successful ones 
are the ones that, that are able to take advantage of those situations. And, and but I think that is why strategy matters, that, that you do need to build out, here's what our plan is. Because if you, you know, um, somebody once described a, a good campaign to me as someplace where all the tumbleweeds, like they start rolling and they all coalesce into a giant tumbleweed ball, which I guess is a good analogy here while we're here in Kansas. But, um, you know, I, I think that what, what the reality is, is, you know, you're trying to keep this massive organization, you know, kind of on a highway. And there are exits and entrances you know, and they're not spaced evenly, and they're not all the same size, and, you know, every part of your organization is at any moment, um, you know, it's, it's, it's like the universe where, like, you know, chaos can take over at any moment. So I think that that's why strategy matters even more, so that you can try to keep, you know, try to keep on the highway, and so that, you know, fewer of the, fewer of your little, you know, organizational, or organisms of your organization are sort of, you know, falling off into these distractions of, you know, what happened at the such and such convention on such and such day, or, you know, what news cycle is, what the news cycle is kind of throwing at you. So, yeah, and I think that, you know, we're right. I think we have gotten obsessed with tactics. Chris. Jonathan, one, to try to answer your question of the next leaders or where the party goes, I, I think what was, what was lacking in the Republican primary was not a movement grassroot takeover of the Republican Party, unlike draft go order in 64, even 72, and McGovern for the Democrats, and certainly Ronald Reagan from 1976 on to 1980, where there was a dramatic movement for the party. I thought, I, I really think we don't, we didn't have that this time, nor did we have a generational challenge like the, uh, the Democrats mm -hmm. to, now right. we will likely have a generational challenge in 2012, but the Republican governors just met uh, early in November, mid-November, in Florida. So typically, you'd, you'd see a, a, a non-Washington personality uh, crystallize around uh, a, a leader, an executive. Mm -hmm. But they first need to do exactly what Ed's talking about: get your principles and let a personality crystallize around those. Is it Palin? Well, if I, yeah, if I could put you guys on the spot, just if we go around, we have about three more minutes. Okay. Who do you, I'm not going to ask you who you predict to win the nomination, that's kind of cruel, but who do you see as the face of the Republican Party over the next four years? I think it's the governors, and I think that whether we like it or don't like it, Sarah Palin's going to be a very significant part of this party. She's going to be the most significant fundraiser. I mean, the only handicap she has is she's in Alaska, and she can't be running to Iowa and New Hampshire. Uh, Equally as important, uh, I, I don't think she's quite sure what her principles are at this point in time. <laughs> but I think I think I think the governors are going to be. I don't, I don't see any Washington leader emerging at this point in time. Uh, and no offense to the House leaders or the Senate leaders, I just don't see anybody coming forth that all of a sudden everybody's going to coalesce around. Uh, and I, but I do think some of these governors may very well, and past and present. Uh, <coughs> Anyone else going to take a stab? I think it's all. I think it's the governors too. And, and I think they did a really good job at the RGA recently in, in, in articulating that, that, that there's a mandate there. Do you guys agree with Ed that, that Sarah Palin is the dominant sort of figure for the party? When I say dominant, I, I don't, I know, I mean, I don't I, but she's, yeah, she's, she's, she's someone who can raise the money. She's the one everybody's going to want to have come campaign for. Uh, and, and, you know, whether, she, whether when I, voters get a hold of her again, I don't know what happens. But uh, I, I agree that, that it is going to probably be the governors. But which of the governors is going to be, I think, is, is yeah. kind of way up in there. And it's going to be a while, I think, yeah. before that's really sorted out. Our party has a lot of, a lot of soul searching to do and a lot of uh, 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 things to go through before that, that person comes forward. But I do think uh, Governor Palin is, is going to be a significant player in that. I think the governors of the party are definitely going to be the face of the party, but I wonder sometimes, and maybe we can get some insight later from Joe Gaylord, I think Newt Gingrich may be the brain of the party in the sense of taking the conservative principles and figuring out how to apply them to today's problems, because that's our biggest challenge. And that's a 40-pound brain that Newt has, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it would be great if we had, you know, if, if we could organize 500 young business people, you know, across the country to run for state legislature. Because I think one of the things that Sarah Palin, you know, proved was that our, our bench on the Republican side, you know, we, we need work. We, you know, she did 99% of what we asked her to do. She did with skill and aplomb. And, you know, there was a couple of things that she just... You know, she just needed more practice before she could do them as well as, you know, as well as we would have wanted her to do. And I think that that isn't her fault. That isn't our fault. That's just the reality of sort of our bench right now. So to your point, I got asked the question a thousand times. And of course, I, I live in New York City where there's 79,000 McCain supporters out of 1.8 million voters. Uh, I was one of them. Uh, I get asked the question, all, why Sarah Palin? Why not some other woman? And when you explain that there are eight women in our party, and now Mrs. Dole is gone, 
-hmm. who are senators or governors, I mean, that tells you the whole, the whole problem. Uh, and meanwhile, Democrats by the day are adding more and more and more to their, to their bench. And I think we just have to go out and really focus. We need women leaders. We need minority leaders. We need Hispanic leaders somewhere that's going to become significant. Uh, and we have to really start looking at the demographics. And we've got a lot of districts that are safe Republican districts, the efforts of Joe's and others. We've drawn some districts where a Republican can win. And we've just got to make sure some of these people get through the primary and become future leaders. I think on that note, we're going to bring this first session of our 2008 post-election conference to a close. We will reconvene uh, for the Democratic primary session in exactly 15 minutes at 4 o'clock. So enjoy. And thank you very much, panel. That was fantastic. <laughs>